everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to have uh, John Bruna with us today. John is uh, an associate professor at the current institute at NYU in the Department of Computer Science, uh, Department of Mathematics, and Center for Data Science. He belongs to the CILVR group and to the math and data groups. Uh, he's also a scholar at the Center of Computational Mathematics and uh, Flatteron, hope I say this right, Institute. Um, his research interests are focused on theoretical foundations of machine learning, high dimensional statistics, and applications of uh, neural networks to computational sciences. Um, he has been granted a number of uh, different awards, including Sloan Research Fellowship, an NSF Career Award, and a number of best paper awards. So it's a little pleasure to have you here with us and uh, take it away. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Eleni, and thank you for the nice invitation. So today I'm very happy to present you some of the work that I've done uh, together with some of my great collaborator collaborators. So uh, Alberto Vietti and Luca Venturi, uh, who are, so Alberto is a postdoc here at NYU, but Luca just graduated last year. And then the second part of the talk uh, with uh, Min Jai Song, a PhD student of mine, and Ilya Zadik, who is now a postdoc at MIT. And so the, the theme really of my talk is uh, the, like the backdrop is the backdrop that you would imagine uh, in uh, you know someone st studying uh, the success of deep learning, uh, really motivated by now like a very strong realization that what started like as you know uh, interesting results uh, in computer vision and speech now are becoming really a de, de facto tool uh, that are really uh, as changing computational science. So we really need to bring some mathematical understanding of when and why this, this networks can work. So uh, if one really takes this question from the, let me just ask everyone to, to mute like it. So really the, the, the way I start to think about this problem is that I, we see all these like a, a different from, from through all these different numerical experiments, we see that there's like something that is in common in all these, in all these situations that is data, uh, be, you know, belong into a very high dimensional space, yet through potentially simple mechanisms, these architectures are able to, to extract useful information. And the learning algorithm in that sense is pretty naive. It's just like based on, on first order optimization methods. And so really the, the kind of the, the questions that uh, are um, driving my, my research uh, and like basically the, the backdrop of today's talk is really how can we start to build some kind of like mathematical story or you know pose mathematical questions around this 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 uh, these successes, and then more particularly in the second part of the talk, we are going to try to understand whether so to what extent we can uh, characterize this learning in high dimensions as one of these instances where we have a, a potential gap between the statistical performance and what can be achieved with computational methods with let's say polynomial time algorithms. And so like the, just to set a little bit the notation and the, the, the setup here, when I think about high dimensional learning, I'm just thinking about really like the very standard supervised learning problem, maybe just a regression. So uh, we are, our starting point would be the ERM, which is uh, just trying to find a, a hypothesis that has, that has good training error and has good training error with uh, some small complexity delta, right? Like all so this is like the standard uh, starting point of uh, ERM. And so again, like the, the basic way to think about how well we can we are learning the function we care about is like with the competition of the risk, uh, using again basic uh, like traditional uh, results. We we can think about this error as containing three fundamentally different sources. So the first one is really this approximation error that is really asking us to come up with hypothesis spaces that are meaningful to the problem we want to learn. So we're going to design a hypothesis that whose you know, inductive bias, if you want, captures the, the, the function we want to learn. Then we also need to, to take care of the statistical error, which is really the error that, that comes from optimizing the bone function. Uh, so instead of optimizing the, you know, the, the training error, we are really interested in optimizing the test error. So we need to pay a price for that. And then lastly, also, of course, this computational aspect that I mentioned at the beginning, where many are just writing these objective of learning objective and this form is maybe putting under the rack the computational difficulties of finding such hypotheses, right? And so the, the, really like the challenge is how can we build a theory that is uh, good at all these three errors at the same time? And so if we start from uh, like 
classic, you know, we look at the toolkit of a functional analysis and try to come up with the hypothesis spaces that are, let's say, standard, classic, we can see very quickly that there's, there's, a, there's a hard problem uh, lurking here, right? Like if you look for hypothesis spaces that are just functions that are locally, better like a Lipschitz functions, we all know that this is like a too large of a hypothesis, right? Like there's a, the number of samples I need to learn such functions is crossed by dimension, as we know. Then, of course, if we try, if we put a little bit more smoothness into the target, like for example, with a Sobolev space, then we can, uh, in that sense, uh, break the curves of dimensionality, but the code the, at the expense of only allowing very, very, very smooth functions, right? Like the number of derivatives that, that break the, you need to break the curves has to be proportional to the dimension. Which of course, if you are working with images that have millions of pixels, uh, makes no sense. Uh, recently, uh, there's also been some efforts to kind of break away from these uh, traditional, you know, kind of L2 Hilbert kind of spaces uh, by something that pe some people call the Baron space or the total variation space, which are really like a, a spaces that are very interesting. But they are just to say here that they are really adapted to learning with shallow networks, right? And so it's really functions whose whose Fourier transform is very smooth, right? So I guess in, in, all, in, in, in all in all, I guess the, the thing that I wanna you know, uh, explain here is that there's in, in none of this uh, situation, none of these spaces really takes into account kind of the geometric prep and nature of the problem. Like the fact that the, the, here, the input domain that I presented in the first slide, like be it images, speech or molecules, or you know, uh, these kind of measurements that come from the physical world, they are really not, very well captured by this hypothesis. So what do I mean by that is this, what we call geometric function classes, right? And so it's very, what, what I'm stating here is the target function that we're gonna learn is known to be smooth along certain transformations of the input that are known. And so here's an example that I always like to present of such transformation, right? So here we have uh, art, like five, uh, you know, uh, female painting art from many, many, uh, years ago, like uh, that spans like uh, 500 years. Uh, and so here, what you see is like a transformation, right? That is uh, just basically moving the pixels around. And this is a transformation that you can see that there's a certain sense of continuity, right? Like the, the identity or like the style, the artistic style is something that varies smoothly. And so this notion of regularity is not captured by a Lipschitz assumption or by a Sobolev assumption or by a Baron assumption, right? This is really something that extract, that uses very strongly the geometric properties of the input, namely that these images are really in themselves signals that live in a two-dimensional way. Okay, and so natural question that we are trying to understand in the first part of the talk is: Can we actually construct a learning theory that somehow is able to extract, like, to, to get like better guarantees when we have these like geometric function spaces? And for this, we are going to take a very simple uh, setup of regression. And also, by the way, uh, in, any question you might have about the setup or like the notation, et cetera, please do not hesitate to interrupt. Very happy to keep this quite informal. So just please uh, feel free to. So here we have a regression setup uh, where I'm assuming that the data is in the high dimensional space and it's basically just unit norm. So I'm putting no assumptions on the data distribution other than it has unit energy. And so the target is the, some, there's, there's an unknown function f star that I observe with some noise, so very standard. And then what the goal of the, my game is to do well in terms of the excess rates, right? So to get like a good generalization with respect to this ground truth target test. And so in the, in the space that I'm considering, I can uh, essentially think about any function that lives in that input space as belonging to the space of all functions that have uh, basically that are square integral. And so this is really uh, something that, a very natural, like the, the kind of the, the natural uh, space in which I can measure regularity of these functions is the what's called the spherical harmonic decomposition, which is essentially a Fourier transform where the domain instead of being RD is now the sphere. So the point is that I can think about my function as a superposition of functions that have been increasing oscillations, if you want, and in that case, like these basis functions are given by harmonic polynomials of increasing degree, and so. As a, as a reflection of this kind of curse of dimensionality, as you can see, for a given fixed degree, as, as I increase the frequency, right, of the oscillation, the number of basis functions that have this high frequency grows up, blows, like grows exponentially with dimension, right? And so that's really a, 
uh, something to be expected. So of course, this space, as, as we said, it's of course far too large. And so the way, the standard way we are, where we can do some non-parametric regression uh, in this context is through what we call a, a kernel. Okay, so a kernel is just uh, you know in our context here. I'm just going to define it through this activation function kappa. And so what it does is that instead of looking for any possible function that I can express in this uh, spherical harmonic, I'm going to look for functions that are integrable after I put these weights, apply these weights into the coefficients, right? And this mu k minus one, I have an explicit expression in terms of the regularity of the activation function. Okay, so here, if you are not familiar with this world of kernels, just the, the take home here is that I can design this kappa and the more smooth I change, I make this kappa, the faster I'm gonna have a decay, right? And so I'm gonna have a decay here that is gonna impose more regularity on my target function, right? And so uh, now the question is really, how can we take this very classic object tool that is the kernels and use them, like, you know, upgrade them to work with uh, geometric function classes. Okay, so here we are gonna assume that our image is discretized. Let's say that have D pixels in my grid. Now I'm gonna think about transformations as, I, as, I, as you were saying in the video before that are kind of moving the pixels around, right? And so how are you gonna model like transformations that move the pixels around? Well, with permutations, right? Permutations that can just like shuffle the pixels uh, in, in the domain. Okay, so any permutation of the pixels is gonna define a linear transformation over the images just by just you know, applying the change of variables. And so just to keep in mind that, you know, the kind of transformations that we can model here would be, uh, you know, rotation, right? If we will take the pixels in a certain way, for example, we can uh, change the, the, kind of the orientation of an image. Okay, this is of course a much more general model. And so just for to fix ideas, I mean, the, the, it's not necessary to be a subgroup, but just for, for simplicity, just assume that you have a, a subgroup of these permutations, right? So they form a subgroup by composition. And so now that I have this set of transformations that I care about, I can define a smoothing operator. So what is a smoothing operator? It's an operator that takes any hypothesis F and it's gonna replace it by the average along the orbit. Okay, so this is a pictorially, it seems like a very natural thing to do is that uh, I organize my inputs into these kind of fibers, like the, the orbits of the group. And I'm gonna replace a, you know, a hypothesis by its average over the orbit. Okay, so, so that defines very naturally the notion of an invariance, because what is an invariant function is a function that doesn't change by its motion, right? Because it's, if it's constant in the first place, it's not gonna be a, a affected by this motion. And we can also use this operator to define a natural extension of, of invariance, which is the stability. Okay, so in the case where this operator, this G is, an, is a general subset, not necessarily a subgroup, we can think about F star functions that are stable as kind of functions that are kind of low pass, right? So think about this as a smoothing, so it's a low pass filter or something. So F star is a stable function if it's like the image of, a, of another function F tilde through this or uh, a smoothing operator. Okay, but just, Keep in mind that this, the invariance is essentially everything you need for, for this stuff to work. All right. And so now we have this, uh, we have this original kernel that is this dot product kernel. And now we can uh, you know, consider it's invariant, an associated invariant kernel, right? Which is just, again, like uh, replacing this uh, element wise, uh, like this cap uh, activation function by all the possible kind of, uh, translated or like shifted versions of, the, of this dot product. Okay. And so this uh, invariant kernel has a, a, very, a very nice and natural property is that in fact, these two operators, they define uh, what's called in integral operator that are very similar. So basically what it means is that they share the same uh, eigen structure, right? So they have the same eigen functions. They have the same eigen values. The only thing that changes is the multiplicity of the eigen values, right? And so before the multiplicity of this, uh, uh, of the integral operator of the kernel, is precisely the number of har spherical harmonics of a fixed degree. Now we have less because in a sense, this, this object is smaller. Okay, and so the other uh, immediate property is that if I have my function that is invariant to the action of the group, then if I look at how well I can approximate this function in the corresponding RKHS, I, I, said, I realized immediately through application of Pythagoras theorem that I have the same approximation error if I use the, the original kernel 
than if I use the invariant kernel. Just because the, the target I'm going to approximate is in the subspace, right? It's in the it's invariant with respect to the operator. So a very natural conclusion, right, is that if uh, so invariant kernels, they are as good at approximating invariant functions as the original kernels, yet they are smaller, right? Just because they have a smaller, let's say, smaller multiplicity in the eigenvalues. So I have the same approximation power with a smaller hypothesis class, so I can only do better, right? I can only get like smaller, you know, the, the question is really is how much smaller, right? So how much are you able to gain in this by using this uh, invariant kernel than if you use the original kernels? Ah, I have a question in the chat. Why is that two dimensional? Yeah, that this is a unit sphere, right? So I I, I fix the basically the, the norm of the function to be uh, to be uh, one. So basically I have a manifold of co-dimension one in the in B dimensions. Okay, and so now we are going to study generalization error by looking at basically the most basic estimator uh, in uh, that involves kernels, which is the kernel bridge progression, which is uh, this like, given some data. I'm going to try to fit a function uh, that fits the data with small error that has small norm in the arcades, right? That's the standard. And, and so the parameter here is this something that controls the, the trade off between approximation between fitting to data and complexity. So there was a, a very nice uh, work by uh, Songmei, uh, Theodor Mikhevich, and Montan Andre Montanari uh, la last year called, where uh, they uh, studied precisely this problem, and they um, and they they studied this problem in what they call this high-dimensional regime, which is the regime where you are sending the dimension to infinity, and you are uh, and you are sending the number of data points to infinity. With a certain rate, right? That is uh, like in that case, like a polynomial of dimension. And so now they they can uh, they can uh, obtain like in the punchline is that they can obtain complexity gains, so so you know, savings in sample complexity that are of a factor equal to t to the alpha, some power of uh, some power of b. And this is what they call the group degeneracy. So just to give a sense of what is this group degeneracy, is that if I have one dimensional shift, like say I have an image and I just shift it. Uh, you know, I have like, I think that my pixels are along, along one dimension. So I have all the possible translations to that domain. Basically what I'm having is I'm saving a factor of dimension, right? Because I'm, you know, I'm, I don't have any, uh, basically I don't have no information along the location, right? So I'm kind of killing one degree of freedom. And so uh, the, the limitation is that uh, their analysis can only explain savings that are polynomial in dimension, right? Uh, so large degeneracy groups like things that are go much beyond this uh, shift Kind of shift and like small degeneracy are out of the scope. So what we are uh, trying to do here is uh, what what can we say when we have invariants that are much larger, right? like uh, you know larger groups, maybe in a regime that is more favorable. So instead of us sending b and n to infinity at the same you know certain rate, we are just gonna fix dimension and see what happens as n increases. Right. So potentially we can learn more functions than just polynomials. Okay, so that's what we do. And uh, the, the, the device that we use to do that is something that is called the degrees of freedom. Okay, so the degrees of freedom of a kernel, uh, of a kernel of its progression, is essentially a, a natural extension of the intrinsic dimension in which the regression happens, right? And so it's really expressed as a certain ratio between the eigenvalues of the kernel, right? Uh, like when, when you introduce this lamp, kind of a cutoff, right? You kind of introduce a cutoff in the frequency in the spectral domain. And so this degrees of freedom counts how many effective uh, you know, eigenvalues are, are affecting the estimation. And so uh, this is like a measure of the size of the, of, the kind of, of the estimation. So naturally, what we are trying to do is to compare the degrees of freedom between the normal kernel without the invariance and the invariant kernel. Okay, and so these savings, like the, you know, how small are they are, is controlled by this ratio, right? This is a new DL. Which uh, we define it as, as, in, uh, as I introduced a few slides ago, as the ratio between the uh, spherical harmonic are invariant against the total spherical harmonics, right? So it's, a, it's a something that measures how many harmonics are invariant. And so the, the result here that we have is that we take this traditional uh, source and capacity condition, which is the, the source condition uh, as for some regularity of your target function, okay? And the capacity condition is impo imposes a certain decay on the eigenvalues of your kernel. 
So these are kind of very standard tools to study uh, statistics in, in terms of rich progression. And so the punchline here is that if we use this, the invariant kernel and with an invariant target, we get a generalization error where basically the, the nominal rate would be of the order of one over n to something that depends on the regular, on the source and capacity conditions. And so now in our case, we replace this factor one by this factor that is this ratio between the invariant harmonic type for this. So this is a little bit hard to, to parse. So let me just uh, you know give you kind of the, the punchline, right? Is that uh, in, in you know the, the it turns out that the right uh, asymptotics for this ratio is a is a ratio that basically uh, you know has like a kind of asymptotic value, asymptotic level that is precisely one over the size of the group plus some decay that we can actually control, right? Some decay that depends on a certain uh, spectral properties of the group. And so at the end of the day, we, if we optimize, this is the traditional way in which you have an upper bound that has one big, one free parameter, and then you optimize the, the upper bound, you minimize the upper bound by just finding the optimal trade off. And so if you do that, you get basically at the end some rate that really has, like it's a bound that basically tells you that the, the best possible gain in several complexity is proportional to, you know, to the size of the group, like this, the effective gains in several complexity is that you are multiplying the number of samples by number of samples times the size of the group. And then this is a, a, an asymptotic gain. And so how far you reach this asymptotic gain depends on these like spectral properties that are driven by this spectrum. So there's a couple of comments that I wanna make here. The first one is that here you can see that, uh, you know, as much as we can have gains that are, you know, large, a priori like, a, you know, if the group is very large, you can have large gains. They are not sufficient to break the cause of dimensionality. Okay, because if, if, if you think about like the, the case where the function, the target function is not very smooth, like a Lipschitz function, you get an exponent here that is cursed, right? You get something here that is of the order of one of a D. So even if you multiply something here that is exponential in dimension, right? Like something that here is exponentially uh, small in dimension, it's gonna be kind of killed by this one of a D here. Okay, so there's no impact on the rate when you're using variance. And the other thing I want to comment is that these things are, are minimax with matching constant, right? So in other words, there is a, there's a certain sense that these benefits in the upper bound, they are real, right? That, that there's a real gain uh, in using the invariant kernel than, than not using the invariant. All right, so now maybe uh, we can see a few examples on how does this thing translate when we use like specific groups of invariants. So just to hopefully give you like a little bit of a sense of what's going on. So if we look, for example, like translation group, right? So this is a cyclic group on dimension D. Uh, we recover the same uh, kind of results as uh, Song and Theodore and Andrea. Uh, so in other words, we get gains that are uh, asymptotically of the order of one of a D, which is the size of the group. And these gains are, rate, are achieved pretty fast, right? So basically this is achieved with a fast rate. So the number of samples doesn't need to be very big to achieve this, to absorb these gains. Now we make, Instead of looking at global translations, we make it local translations. So think that every, let's say that you have image and then every patch you can translate inside every patch, but there's no global translation. So in that case, you can see that the group is much bigger, right? Because instead of having a single shift for the whole image, you have one parameter per patch, right? So you get like a group that becomes exponential in dimension if the patches are small, but the, the price to pay is that here, in that case, the, the rates that you get, right? So you get gains that are much bigger synthetically, but they are reached in a much far, for much larger sample sizes. Uh, you can get the best, of, the best of both worlds, but having by having different groups. For example, if you look at the full permutation group, which is basically, I can move the pixels anywhere I want, right? So I have a full permutation group. Then you can get something that here is like, of course, exponential in dimension. And here it's also exponential in the image, okay, like a fast rate. And then finally, just to, to demonstrate that the, the, you know, the techniques here are relatively flexible, right, and robust, we can even deal uh, with a case that where the, the transformation doesn't even form a group, right? It's just a subset. And here is what I call these small deformations. So think about permutations that are not too different from a shift, right? So this would model the situation where Imagine that you have like in a 3D, like in a video scene, you have something like people that are moving or different objects are moving at different speeds. Things are not exactly a translation, but they are not too far from being a translation. Okay, so in that case, you get, again, like a gains in several complexity that are exponential and achieved at the fast rate. Okay, 
So, so just as like a kind of a takeaway from from this uh, first part, is that we can uh, then we can start by trying to analyze, study the role of invariance in in deep learning or in machine learning in general by plugging it with you know like solid uh, you know well crafted uh, kernel theory. Because in the sense, like the, the, the regularity assumptions that underpin uh, kernel methods, they are kind of compatible with these geometric function spaces, right? So it's like a, we, we, are, we, we don't lose too much by combining these two objects. And so the one of the take homes that we see is that in, even, in, even in the case where these invariant groups are very large, right? So it translates into very large gains in sample complexity. These gains are not sufficient to break the curse of conventionality, right? It means that we need, when we think about why deep learning works, etc., it's not just about the environment, right? The architecture can, you know, can, you know, can, can help us learn more efficiently, but there has to be something else that explains why we can learn in high dimensions. And so, of course, the, the natural hypothesis that is missing here is that the locality, right? The fact that uh, instead of having to process the information you know, globally, right? By just looking at how all the pixels interact with, uh, with each other, we can start by looking at local interactions and stuff. And this, of course, breaks the curse of dimensionality, okay? Without so much surprise, because now the kind of the, the effective dimension is not the dimension of the image, it's the dimension of the patch. And so this you, uh, has been quantified through the several works. The, some recent works are one from Alberto and uh, also from a group of uh, Matthew Wyatt at FFL, Fabero. And of course, also the, this nice work by Francis Mack two years ago. And so I guess uh, some of the interesting questions for future work is now that we have understood how to combine these kind of geometric function classes with kernels, natural question is, okay, how, how can you do that in the, also in the feature learning regime, right? So in the fact, in the, in the regime where you have these neural networks that do something that is probably more powerful than kernels. Right? And this is an, it's an interesting question for future. So maybe now this is a, a, a great time to ask if there's any question about this part, because what I'm going to talk about next is a, a bit of a different flavor. I think there are, John, there's a few questions in the chat. Maybe, uh, Amir, do you want to ask your question yourself or do you want me to read it? Ah, okay, no, I see. Yeah, yeah but, you can ask. Okay, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, I guess, uh, so if, uh, a few slides ago, you mentioned that uh, kind of, the minimax result lower bounds are kind of compatible with uh, this fact that we can kind of avoid the curse of dimensionality. But those minimax results don't have, uh, as far as I know, these extra assumptions that, well, we have this G invariance or things like that. So uh, is- Yeah, so, so the, the sense in which I have these minimax results is that the, basically there are functions in the RKHS that really Require that have that sample complex that basically that generation bounds. So, so in other words, the the non-invariant part is non improvable in the minimax sense. So, right. any improvement, the improvements that we bring through the invariants are real, right? In that sense, that they, they are filling up. Both in both cases, uh, if you if you only work with functions that are non-smooth, you are still lost, right? In the sense that uh, even even the boost that you get from the invariant kernel does not help you get a better rate. Right, and this is uh, this is basically a kind of the negative aspect of our result here. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. All right. There was one more question from from David. Um, I guess this was earlier in the. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think I tried to answer like the, there was this distinction between d and d minus one. Yeah. Yeah, this is because uh, you know like the the the, the d dimen like the d dimensional unit sphere has intrinsic dimension that is d minus one, right? Just because there's a one constraint that is the norm. But this is really a, um, I mean, uh, we, we we presented the results on the sphere because uh, they kind of use techniques that were a little bit more easier to manipulate. But everything I say here, if you replace the unit unit measure over the sphere by let's say Gaussian in the input, uh, we we believe that many of these results go through, like actually all of these results go through by having to change a little bit the you know the technical ingredients. But uh, any other, another question from Graham? Graham Graham has his hand up. Graham? Yes, I do. So I was just wondering, <laughs> is is it right to think of this as a structured way of doing inductive bias design for your models? Yeah, good question. So here it's really an attempt to. Uh, understand whether this 
like thinking about inductive bias just in terms of the symmetries that they're able to capture, whether this can, can bring you all the way to something that is successful, right? So here, as you might have seen, there's, we, have, we are making no attempt to say this architecture is efficient, right? I mean, I, I introduced these invariant kernels in a way that is very brutal, right? Just like averaging, like it's a kind of a global pooling over the orbit of the group. If the group is very large, you can see that this is crazy, right? I mean, you would not never implement it like that. But even though like the statistical properties of this object are not improved, right? They, they cannot, you need to combine them with something else, right? And this is where the inductive biases that we see practice, they really treat the group in a way that is very progressive, right? Like a multi-scale, there's a sense in which you don't wanna just deal with, it, with the group as a, as, a, as a kind of as a monolith and just treat it as a, you know, as a single thing that which you, you kill it. There's a certain sense in which you have to do it again and again and again through different layers of the architecture, right? And there's this locality that is important. So, uh, yeah, so what we do here is more like the, the, the statistician's work, right? Of uh, trying to get the kind of the, like negative results. Yeah, make sense? Okay, great. So now let me uh, move to the, to the second part of the talk, which is, has to do more with optimization, right? And, and in particular, uh, some results in which we are gonna try to argue that this is actually a very interesting uh, and rich question, even when you make the neural network very, very, very simple. Okay, so just to, to, to find like the setup in which I'm gonna be presenting our results. So the canonical setup is that I have again, some, some regression problem that I try to learn in some like, uh, you know, function space that has some complexity. And so uh, if I just think about this problem in function space, uh, you know, a priori I have no problem because everything is a convex functional, right? This, everything is convex with respect to the function. But then if I introduce this parametrization, right? That I, I try to explore hypothesis space that are interesting, I might have like a nonlinear mapping between parameters and functions which basically introduces this like very complicated non-complexity, right? Like the landscape here, the optimization can be pretty bad, right? As, as we know from other works already. So the question really is that even if we have, even if we make the architecture very, very, very simple, let's say like a shallow neural network, where, we, where are we at in terms of understanding how hard is this problem? So there's one uh, set of works that, that seem to give us like a, some hope, right? Uh, and in fact, it was a very nice set of works uh, that were developed all like around the same year uh, by different groups that really exploited this notion of, of over parametrization. And the, the, the punchline there is that by making the architecture with many, many, many parameters, I could somehow alleviate the non-convexity that I present. Okay, and the way that where this works is by treating, in the case of the shallow neural network, I think my function as an average of functions, right? In that case, these little functions are all very simple. They are just like a single neuron, right? So I have an average, I have a, my function is an average of many, many, many neurons. And so what, uh, a very interesting uh, point that they were put forward in these papers is to take what we call this Eulerian perspective, right? So that rather than thinking my, the parameterization of my function in parameter space, like where I have maybe a set of parameters for every neuron, I think about the parameterization of this function in terms of, like a probability measure over the over the over the over the parameters, right? So I think that uh, like think, think that every neuron is a parameter, so it could be like different particles. So I just describe the state of the system with the density, the empirical density of these particles. And this seems might seem like a technicality, right? I'm, I'm just changing the language, but it has it's actually a very, a very powerful change of language, right? In the sense that now, if I express this new object, this empirical measure, I can rewrite my function. As an, as, an, as an integral, as an expectation with respect to this empirical average. So now I have, again, a dependency between the new parameters and my function that is linear, right? Which means that I, I still have something that recovers a convex structure, right? So if I express my now my loss in terms of this new object, this probability measure, I have, I have something that is convex. And of course, there's something to pay that now I need to operate, manipulate an object that is much more complicated. It's a probability measure that lives in an infinite dimensional space and, when I, and whenever I move this object, I have to understand what's called the bus time measure. But the bottom line, and, and this is like the nice thing that these papers did, is that as the width of the network becomes very large, I could somehow transfer optimization guarantees from the infinitely, infinitely wide neural network that would uh, just work with any probability measure back to the empirical measure. Okay, so there's this very rich bridge 
between kind of the Lagrangian perspective and the Lewin perspective that was very nice. Okay, but there's one little problem is that this kind of guarantee that we recover is only true in the limit, right? When n, the number of neurons is very large. And in fact, the dependency between the number of neurons and the dimension is coarse in general. Under these general assumptions, right? The only way I can, you know, leverage this kind of like a convexification of the problem is by essentially putting one neuron at every corner of my parameter space, so reading the space, right? And so we know that this is something that is infeasible in high dimensions. And so the, these are, I describe it in what we call this feature learning regime, like the active, active regime. There's a similar picture that emerges if you use this like maybe simpler regime, which is like the kernel regime, like the NTK, right? Like in the NTK, you really get also, uh, you, you know, you are hit by this cause of nationality in, in the terms of approximation. And so whatever we do, right, this over parameterization seems to solve a little bit of our optimization nightmares, but it seems that it's not quite there, right? And so the question is, is there some inherent computation harness that we that, that kind of explains the result? So are, is it because we, are, we didn't find the right proof, the right technique, or is there some inherent harness that makes this kind of curse that is unavoidable? Okay, so that's what we want to understand. So the first notion of harness that we can uh, study is what we call this algorithmic specific harness, right? Which is instead of trying to ask whether the problem is hard you know, for any algorithm, I can first focus on, a, focus on certain classes of algorithms, for example, gradient descent. And so uh, what we know, I mean, and this is a nice, very nice work by Ohad, is that uh, if I even if I take like very simple cellular networks, so here I'm just looking at this at the target, a neural network that has only one neuron. The activation function of this neuron uh, is in a certain like periodic function, right? Think about like a sine or something. So it's a strange neuron, but it's just a single neuron. And so if I try to learn this function with gradient descent, I will essentially be confronted with a landscape, optimization line landscape that looks like that. And so this, as you might imagine, right? If you imagine this thing in high dimensions, means that basically you are lost, right? It's like you think that you have like a very flat Earth, and it's like a golf course that has like has one hole hidden somewhere in the earth, right? It's really like this notion of a needle in a haystack, right? The, there's no information, there's no local information in the landscape of where you should go to find this hole, right? Because the hole is very, very narrow. And the same way, the same kind of negative result that you get for gradient descent, there's a there's a very interesting uh, uh, line of work that really made this kind of lower bond uh, extended to a larger family of algorithms. And so the, uh, something that is called the statistical query lower bounds is a framework that really combines information theory and computation that really uh, limits like any learner can only interact with the data by computing noisy expectations. Right? So you can query some, some information from the data and it comes to you through the, through, through the form of a expectation with respect to data plus some noise. So in this framework, we can also obtain like lower bounds, right? That really uh, uh, show that for certain classes of shallow neural networks, it's not possible to learn, right? There's a, the number of, of queries that you need, it grows exponentially uh, with respect to the parameters of the problem. And so the question really is that, okay, we have this, you know, evidence that if I use like a, you know, gradient descent kind of techniques or like statistical queries, the problem is hard to learn. So does this extend to any polynomial time algorithm? Is, are, we, are we really hitting, you know, like a, like a wall here? Or do we need to think a little bit out of the box and even consider algorithms that are not gradient descent? And so uh, that's what we are set to study. And this is a joint work with uh, Min Jai Song and Ilya Zadik. So here we have the problem, again, very simple, where we have a single neuron, like f of x is just a single neuron. We are, again, uh, using a pretty academic example, which is just the activation function is a cosine. So think about it like a, you know, like a wave. And then this wave is just a, like placed in a high dimensional space with a hidden direction. And so we observe this function with some noise, right? And so the parameters of the problem is the amount of noise that they have. And of course, the, the, you know, the, the frequency of oscillation, right? Which always, we always said to be of the order of square root of d. So when, with, this, with this parameter fixed, the, you know, the hardness of the problem, if you want like the signal to noise ratio of the problem is this uh, inverse uh, strength of the noise, right? Which is the single to noise ratio. And so what we, uh, and so just a few comments, this function, right? That seems like a little bit weird. 
we can approximate it well with a ready network of a single layer with a width that is really just very simple, just like a, of the order of square root of d, right? So it's like a, it's not a very hard, well, it's not very, it's not a very hard function to approximate. And just another comment is that the fact that we have this Lipschitz constant, like the the you know the smoothness of the value of the cosine, and the frequency of the cosine draw with dimension, uh, we we also need it. We, we also use it because otherwise, if you have like a, a dimension-free Lipschitz constant, this is a class that essentially is very easy to learn. And there's a nice work by Daniel Su and some of his uh, Clayton uh, and others, uh, his students, where uh, this is actually a. Uh, Use even we even using kernels, even using random features. And so what we produce here is a landscape of what we call the statistical to computational landscape, right? And and uh, if you haven't, uh, uh, if, you are, if you're not familiar with this literature about the kind of the statistical and computational gaps in statistical, maybe I will spend like uh, thirty seconds talking. What does this mean? So here we are in the x-axis, right? We have the you know the parameter, the SNR, which, as I said, it kind of controls how easy or how hard is the statistical learning problem, like is the learning task, right? So if I have no noise, right, you would imagine that uh, there's much more signal than noise, so it's, the problem becomes easier. And if I have a lot of noise, I'm kind of hiding the signal. So this is precisely what you see, right? If I have if the amount of, if the signal to noise ratio is like below a certain constant, then the problem is impossible. For any method, right? There's just not enough information in the measurements to estimate the function. But then we identify an interesting regime where, you know, if the signal to noise ratio is between certain two thresholds, the problem is statistically possible, right? So there is enough information to estimate the function, but it's computationally hard to do, right? And here, what we, we are going to we are going to introduce, we are going to like express this hardness through a reduction from a from a certain problem in cryptography. Well, that's why we call this crypto hub. Then, uh, as as you get as the noise level goes down and down, you you reach a certain nice sweet spot where we can now at that point estimate the function efficient. Right? We can find the function with a computation algorithm. Okay. So, so the fact that this that the you know the threshold for statistics and the threshold for computation are separate. Right? This is what we call this computation of the statistical gap. Right? Which is one of the few instances where we can prove this this. Case. All right, so how do we construct, how do we understand this example? We understand it by the lattices. Okay, so lattices are uh, just a, can obtain by integer combinations of, of, a, of a basis of RD, right? So we have a basis of RD, and we just look at the points that we can write as an integer combination of these basis points, right? And so uh, lattices are interesting because they provide us with a very nice, uh, Toolkit, a very nice uh, uh, family of, uh, fun of problems that are computationally very challenging. One such problem is what's called the shortest vector problem. Okay, so where's the shortest vector problem? Is I give you a lattice, and you need to find me the vector that is non-zero that has smallest node. So this might seem uh, easy to do in the picture, right? But you have to imagine this in high dimensions, right? And so you can see very quickly. That there's a certain sense in which you should be trying all possible integer combinations, right? And just check, right? Because of course that the basis can be very ill-conditioned, right? I mean, these two, these two vectors, right? Like the two, the two blue vectors are generators of that same lengths. Okay, so and in fact, it's you're right, is that this problem is actually NP-hard. And even an approximate version of this problem is also NP-hard, right? So even if you want to approximate the smallest norm within a factor alpha, right? So if this factor alpha is Essentially, a polynomial. Here it's a quasi polynomial. This is NP hard. And there's a whole interesting uh, range of, uh, you know, like uh, depending on this approximation factor alpha, whether this problem undergoes different kind of, uh, you know, it goes through in the different, undergoes different classes in the complexity kind of uh, hierarchy. Right. And so uh, everything that is essentially a polynomial, uh, it's actually conjectured to be hard. Right. So we don't have, we, it's really believed. That when for alpha that is a polynomial in n in dimension, then this problem is actually hard. All right. And so how are we going to do that? Is now we are going to connect this problem of learning a single neuron with another problem that is uh, another model that we developed uh, last year uh, with uh, Ninja Song, Odet, and, and Ming Tang uh, that was presented at stock, which basically is the problem, is a kind of it's a hypothesis testing problem. Okay, and it goes as follows. So here you can see a two-point cloud that are you know, 
like you're looking at the point clouds from different directions. And, and probably if you stare at this quite a bit, you can see that these two point clouds are different, right? There's one that has some structure, hidden structure, the other one that does, has not. Of course, the hidden structure of the, the one in the left, you, you need to just look at it from the right angle if you want to see it. Otherwise, it almost feels like it should, shouldn't be there. So this is what is formalized by this uh, problem of like a hypothesis testing, right? And so the, this is the problem in both as follows. So you have, uh, uh, you have uh, basically samples that have a component, a vector that is a three-dimensional vector, and then some scalar that here is the color, okay? So the, the high dimensional part is just standard Gaussian. Now your goal is to separate between two different situations. Either the color is uniform, right? So there's no structure. Either the color has a hidden periodic structure. Okay, so there's a, so that certain projection of the data with a hidden direction that if I just uh, mod to take this mod one and switch some noise, I get the color. I can get the color. All right? And so what we prove in this work is that if you are able to solve this problem, then you are essentially solving gap SVT with polynomial factors, which is something that we believe it's not possible. So this is really an example of a reduction, right? So we, we, we reduce from a problem that is known to be hard to this like a, a hypothesis taking problem. One thing that is interesting is that the reduction goes from a worst case problem, which is the gap SVT, to an average case reduction, right? To an average case problem. Our problem here is stated with respect to some underlying distribution, right? Uh, we are only asking this problem to be uh, solvable in, on average. And so, um, all right. So this is just a formal, formalization of the result is that uh, if I, if I want to learn this class of like, it's just a single neuron with this cosine activation function uh, with this noise, uh, I also have this reduction to gap SVT. Okay. So, uh, using this intermediate uh, result and the continuous learning with errors in the, in the as intermediate step, right? And so, uh, just a few comments about this result. <clears throat> we so so uh, first is like the, the role of the noise, right? Like I I told you that the noise here, uh, you know, I didn't give you many many details on what is the noise that we can allow for this harness result. This is like a sort of noise that is a bit similar to what's called massa noise. So basically what it means is that the amount of noise level depends on the position, right? Depends on the value of the function. But this is really not something, uh, it's not necessarily like sterile and you, why might even believe that you could actually get away with it, right? Just let's put it with Gaussian noise. And so just, just to, to emphasize, right? Is that there's a big gap here, right? Is that uh, uh, like when, this, when the noise level, right? Is, uh, you know, when the inverse of the noise is uh, bigger than any, than a fixed constant, we can learn like there's an information theoretical possible algorithm to learn. Of course, it's very expensive, but here what we're showing is that, that there's no polynomial time algorithms that can work uh, up, up until the noises that are like inverse polynomial in the language. So it's basically a pretty good, a pretty big gap. And just also to put this thing into the context, right? It's a, there's a actually interesting firework that also relied on cryptographic hardness results to uh, obtain uh, hardness results for learning, right? Like kind of relating cryptography and learning. Uh, there's some classic works that mostly started in the, in the in the community of boolean functions right like just learning certain like a boolean structures uh relating uh you know leveraging uh, a related model from the continuous learning with us which is the learning with us that is stated in the discrete field and then more recently there's also some work by i mean danielli and, uh, and and bardi that used also like this uh, uh so they relied on a cryptographic assumption that is this average case hardness of certain uh, pseudo random generators, right? So the difference between our case, there are two differences. Like the first one is that our assumption is not an is not an average case hardness; it's a worst case hardness, right? So our assumption, if you if you mean if you if you want, is a little bit safer, right? Because it's just like assuming that the problem is hard in the worst case. Um, all right. Okay. So now we go to the last uh, question. Uh, uh, in this talk, right, is that, okay, I told you that when there's noise, this problem is actually hard, like impossibly hard. Is it necessary? So what happens when there's less noise? Is it necessary to get harmless? And the answer is yes, it, your noise is necessary in the sense that if there's no, no noise or if the noise is very small, then we can actually find an algorithm that runs in polynomial time that can learn this function. Okay. And what is interesting is that this algorithm is not gradient descent. 
right? We know that gradient descent is hard, right? For gradient descent, you cannot learn this function class even with no knots. And it's not in SQ because even SQ algorithms are, SQ, I mean, there's a hardness, SQ hardness, even in this region of knots, right? So we have a, basically a, a new tool, a new algorithmic tool that is able to solve learning problems that gradient descent cannot solve, provably. And, and what is interesting is that the sample complexity that we have here is optimal, right? So, so, so just to get a sense of what we are doing here is that we have, uh, actually this, this class is very simple, right? It's just, uh, you have one neuron. So it's like a generalized linear model. So you have like a linear projection of the data and then you pass it through, an, through a nonlinear function. So uh, if there was no activation function, you obviously, you, with these samples, you can learn the direction, right? Just by solving a linear system. So the cost of nonlinearity is just one extra sample, right? So with one more sample, you can actually completely compensate. You can discover this uh, kind of nonlinear function, of course, because it's already projected in one. And so this algorithm is a is a. I'm going to just say a few words in in the next slide. It's actually just is an algorithm that also has interesting consequences. So uh, it, you can use it to solve to get optimal sample complexity for phase retrieval. So just using D plus one samples. And you can also use it for getting optimal sample complexity for uh, certain problems in Gaussian clustering, right? So basically think about this problem that is this pancake problem that we call, right? You have like two, like a Gaussian mixture that has two components that they are parallel, right? And of course, they, you don't know where they are. And so in this problem, we can also get perfect, like basically optimal sample complexity using the same algorithm. Okay, so what is it algorithm? So this algorithm is again, uh, you know, relying on on it's a lattice it's a lattice basis reduction algorithm. So it comes from the lattice community, and it's really based on the LLL, like from Lenstall Lenstall Lovers algorithm. So it's really like the problem of before of uh, finding this shortest vector problem. But now we are happy with approximation factors that are really exponential in the main. Right. So here the approximation factor that we can use is actually due to the due to the d over two. Right. So it's a pretty bad approximation factor. So there's an algorithm to do that. And in fact, this algorithm is incredibly powerful for our purpose. Okay, so I'm not going to give you too much of the details here, but the, the basically the, the, the way this algorithm is used is through a reduction to a problem that is called a random subset problem. Right? So we are encoding the information that we're looking for into finding a random subset. And so we, can, uh, we can use this like LLL as a primitive to, you know, to characterize, we can we construct a lattice whose shortest vector is really the, fun, the, fun, the, the direction that we are looking for. And so uh, just at the technical level, if you are interested in these things, the key ingredient that is new, we need to understand pretty well these anti-concentration properties of Gaussian polynomials. And this is really for just for the technical audience. All right. And just let's mention that this, uh, this kind of uh, algorithm was also used in a very nice work by Andoni and Daniel Su and others a few years ago. Uh, so it's in a sense, it's like these ideas are very related. Okay, so just to kind of uh, uh, you know tell you where where do you think we want to go from this from this kind of results, you know we can think okay now we have uh, you know some understanding of what happens when you have a single neuron, we could ask what happens if I have a, a model like a function that is maybe a combination of several neurons right like I have uh, some hidden layer that has more than one neuron, okay, and so in a sense like as as you as you as you start increasing the number of neurons, so we have some um, some uh, you know some some results here that really uh, you know like some different works that have and uh, explore different regimes of this problem, right? Uh, and some of them they you know they can allow for uh, you know number of neurons that is of the order of dimension uh, with some tolerance of noise. But of course these algorithms they rely on a, on certain like a, a condition number being positive. And here more general there's also some recent results using smooth noise. But I guess the point that I want to make here. Is that none of these results, uh, you know, uh, work solely relying, relying on gradient descent. Like so, all the things that we can prove about guarantees, they also they always have some something that goes away from gradient descent. And so, one question that you might have, so you can go both ways, right? Either we are not smart enough to prove things about gradient descent, or gradient descent is in fact not the best algorithm that we should be using. I don't know. Sometimes I think about one, one, one answer, sometimes it's the other, I don't know. So just as a conclusion, uh, as I told you that uh, here we, we studied uh, 
essentially like the computational aspects about learning these models, simple models. And we can uh, we we kind of identify that the noise in the label is is a is a key factor, right? It's a key factor of complexity. So in the sense that the, the noise can really go move you from a problem that can be solved to a problem that is impossible to solve. And you don't need to make architectures very fancy. Shallow architectures already exhibit this this phenomenon. Uh, maybe as I said, like maybe an interesting thing maybe to think about more for theorists is whether this separation between gradient descent and other algorithms is something that uh, might or might not have any practical impact, right? I mean, should we, you know, should we maybe start thinking about what's happened to the gradient descent? And then, of course, um, obviously, is that I need, you know, if you put some um, smoothness, like extra assumptions on the target function, right? It's obviously what we need to get like any kind of positive learning guarantee. And there's uh, some nice efforts by uh, Andrew Bosch and, and Emmanuel Abbe and some of his collaborators, where even these assumptions go beyond the shallow model, right? So you can actually, in, in, you know, define interesting classes of functions where the hierarchy, like learning in several layers, is actually uh, what is what makes the learning happen. So with that, I'll, I'll just uh, thank you very much for listening. And these are the references, main references of what I talked about. And so any questions that you might have, um, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, John. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, I think I have a question here on the chat.